Broadcasting from Hollywood, California, it's Grant's Rants, Hollywood Talk. Stephen Colbert and Jimmy Fallon go head-to-head in the ratings race. SNL phases out three cast members, Beyonce and Jay-Z are billionaires, and Alan Thicke's estate gets messy. That and more with Jeff Graham and Sheldon White. Let the ranting begin. I'm sitting across from two producing partners. From episode 27, Jeff Graham is returning to the rants. I'm back. Grant let me return, which is very gracious. I appreciate it. And you're back with Sheldon White. Yes, I am. Yes. Yes. What's up, everybody? Actor and producer Sheldon White, I should say. (laughs) And producer. Yes, Sheldon White. (laughs) So these two have come to me, and obviously we're going to be talking Hollywood talk topics. But we're also going to be getting into a new program that they're producing Mm -hmm. online and what is the name of this project it's called improv 101 yeah it's a comedy sketch series um so sheldon and i met in college but we've been produced we've been working creatively together for the last five years right it's been a minute yeah yeah we'll get into it more i'm sure in our feature but just to give a kind of a brief intro into what the series is we've put together we've co-written and co-directed a six episode sketch series about a dysfunctional improv class so i feel like half of la has taken an improv class before and we've also noticed all the themes like in so many different improv classes no matter where you are there's these theme themes that keep coming Mm -hmm. up right so we kind of made a series about the fun things that go on in improv class yeah exactly sounds good yeah but first, let's talk about some of these ridiculous topics that oh, are on our, yeah. on our minds. Um, let's take a look at late night TV. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been a lot of changes with ratings and, and who's number one in all of this. And Trump has really changed comedy in general. but also <laughs> Everything. Over, everything. Yeah, Trump yeah. has changed yeah. everything. <laughs> For the good and the bad, and yes. for everyone else. Um, <laughs> Fal- Jim, Jimmy Fallon's numbers took a hit when Trump was on in September, and he got a lot of backlash. And we talked about that on this show, and mm-hmm. that was something that I realized on the show that I had not looked at The Tonight Show since Trump was on, and they had that messing up his hair. It was like a funny sketch, kind of like a chat back and forth, and it was such a tense time in this country right before the election. So a lot of people were, like wrote Jimmy off as being ridiculous and not taking it seriously. And I thought about that. I was like, yeah, I was really turned off that he had him on and I haven't watched since. So I guess I'm kind of part of that, <laughs> but now they've spoken with Jimmy, who doesn't give many interviews, and he said that he really regrets not taking him to task a little bit more and taking the situation more seriously. Do you remember, did you watch that that interview? I watched it when it happened, and I actually just watched it again. And I, as I was going, I was trying to figure out why the interview went the way that it did. And I feel like he was trying so hard to be neutral. I feel like he was trying to, like, appease the people who would support Trump and the people that he wouldn't. And I feel like because he spent so much time in this middle area... And then at the same time was kind of messing around with the hair and stuff. I don't think that he has a platform and he can use that platform. And I don't feel like he used his platform in any way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Jimmy Fallon, he's never been one to generate controversy. I mean, like Jimmy Fallon, I feel like is kind of collectively known as the late night host who approaches celebrities and topics with a very distant sense of safeness. And I wonder with that, I wonder with that if it's because... That's who he is, or that's what people above him are I telling wonder, him he yeah. needs to do. Because a, a safeness, if you as a term, mm-hmm. let's say, is really out the window at this point when right. you've got so much competition. Looking at Bill Maher, I mean, all mm-hmm. all the shows that who's on TBS, Samantha, Samantha B. Yeah, I mean, Love her. it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I mean, you, you really, I get. I guess counteracting that with trying to be more positive and fun, but it's just, it's not working. I mean, I agree. I mean, Jimmy, I have opinions about late night. Um, Mm. I, I know he's divisive, but I love Jimmy Kimmel. Um, yeah. Mm. And he's my least favorite of all. Fair enough. I I, I have yet, I I have yet to see to laugh, but yeah, that's it. He's like a specific brand. And that's the thing is, and it's very, um, indicative of this current media climate where everything is so specifically branded. Yeah. And I feel like Fallon is like the guy who plays Pictionary with Jennifer Lawrence. Like he's not going to ask her about like her movie. And that's not, if you want to like see an in-depth interview with Jennifer Lawrence, like you can listen to Fresh Air with Terry Gross or like, mm-hmm. so I, part of me is like, yeah, Jimmy Fallon should have digging 
uh, like dug deeper when Trump yeah. was on, but I'm also like it's also laid down with Jimmy Fallon. Like, right. of course, what do you but, expect? Right. But can I be honest though? I'm really tired of the games. Oh I'm yeah, just kind of a little over it. I totally it's agree, fun, and that's why I don't it was watch Fallon at the time. Right. You know, and it was really like something new, and he really definitely turned the Tonight Show on its head and did a lot of creative things when it started. But now I'm like, all right. I mean, all the YouTube videos, like so and so's playing a game, right. this game. There, you know, it's like there's an egg on someone's head. I'm like, all right. <laughs> it's like he had a trick, and now he's used his trick, and he doesn't know what to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why I don't watch Fallon. Like, say what you will about Leno, and I know some people, a lot of people don't care for him. I liked him, mm-hmm. but he would have interviews and they it would be fun and light but he would ask a pointed question and he would have gone after Trump I'm sure right. not in a negative way in, in a very middle America humor way he probably would have said you know looking do you ever look at your behavior and question it like just really like right. he would have just called it out for sure and I think they also brought up the Muslim ban at one point in that interview and he just let it go and went to the next topic and he could have so easily been like wait a second Ugh. what is this why where are you coming from let me understand like mm-hmm. something yeah. and he just brushed it off and yeah. played with his hair yeah well. it's in- I mean I Jimmy Fallon to me has always occupied this space I think that's why Despite the fact that I wish he would have probed more, I was not at all surprised that he didn't because this is, to me, who Fallon is. is like the goofy guy that plays right, games right. with his guests. Like, Yeah, but I think that he's going to have to adjust a little bit, make some adjustments yeah. the way Colbert did, and it's working for him. He has the he gave CBS the largest late night winning streak in seven years, which he wasn't doing that great in the beginning, and now he's got just if anyone's interested in numbers, he's got three point zero seven mil, and then mm-hmm. Fallon's got two point six eight as of recent. With this, he's you know surpassed the Tonight Show, um, but the Tonight Show still has the younger demographic, of course. Mm-hmm. So they're holding on to that. Um, the average viewers between those two shows is a difference of 0. 0.008 hmm. with Fallon it being number one at the time. But that's looking at this whole last season before things wrap out for the summer. So, I mean, these shows are so neck and neck. I can't say like Fallon's doing poorly, but I think that, you know, CBS is onto something that he perhaps should look into a little bit more than besides like, Pictionary. <laughs> oh, for sure. And it's it's significant because NBC's always been the late night juggernaut. I mean, like the Tonight Show right. since Carson has been the show. So like for Colbert to come in and kind of temporarily dethrone that, even though it seems like they're neck and neck, I think the implications are huge because, yeah, I mean, like it's late night's the only genre of TV where this still happens where people just watch NBC. Like, I think with everything else, they find the program they like or they find the show they like. But, like, people just turn on NBC to watch Late Night because that's how it's been for 60 years. Yeah. So I think it's really significant. Mm -hmm. Colbert, I have to say, I never really was into him because I didn't have cable to college or anything like that to watch the shows that he did. And I very slowly warmed up to him on The Late Show. But now I actually find myself watching him all the time. He comes up in my YouTube feed in the subscription, and I'll surpass The Tonight Show to watch those videos almost always, like nine and a half times out of ten. Mm-hmm. I don't really, I don't I, there's nothing on Val that interests me at the moment. So. I'm going to throw it back to Kimmel for a second, because you said you didn't really, little, he's not your favorite. But no. did you see his interview with Trump? Because I actually watched that today, no, and I thought I he so. did a really nice job, and he really went for it, and he went, he asked the questions that I think a lot of people wondered, and I thought he handled it really well. So I know he's not your favorite person, but I would recommend maybe checking out that interview, because I thought it was great. Yeah, when was that? Was that back in, like, September before the election? I can't remember. I can't even remember now if it's pre-President Trump or It was pre- before. Pre- pre- okay. Before oh, he was. It's yeah, pre-election, yes. so okay, I'd love yeah, to go back and sense. watch it. Yeah, because I don't think he's, I don't think Trump's done any television besides the theatrics at the White House. Oh yeah, I mean, that's enough since, television. Since being in I'm there. pretty sure he said you're, he's one of, the, he's like, you're really confident in yourself. Do you know where that comes from? What's that about? Like he like, <laughs> like you said, he like really went for those things. And he's yeah. like, do you see a psychiatrist? And Trump was like, <laughs> he's like, I don't have time. I'm too busy. Oh God, <laughs> Trump. Well, on the flip side, looking at the number one show in late night, also on NBC, SNL. Now, mm. there's been a shakeup over there in the last couple of hours, of basically, of recording the show. Yeah. And um, who's out? So, I'm an SNL super, super, super fan. And it's funny, because I can acknowledge that, like, it's a hit or miss show, and it's not always consistent. Definitely, yeah. But for me, I love sketch comedy. That's kind of what we're here promoting today. Yeah. 
And I just always watch every episode, every season. Um, this year, they're letting go of Vanessa Bayer, Sashir Zameda, and Bobby Moynihan. Um, Vanessa and Bobby have been there for about seven years each. That's not exact, but it's close. Sashir has been there for about four years. And what's interesting about this story... Wow. Yeah, I know. It feels like less, doesn't it's, it? It seems Sashir? like two... I bet two. I really did. I know. Two wow. seasons. It's because her, her presence on the show, admittedly, hasn't been as strong as the other two um, get, or the other two stars. Um, but, but, what's, do, but doesn't that have to do with content, though, of what you're given? I mm-hmm. mean... I guess you can be talented and, and she got that far. Right. But I mean, I feel like if you're not going to write for the girl, then you can't be surprised if she's not working out. Right. It's like a team thing, though. Like, she also could be proposing things. Is yeah. she right? Maybe she yeah. is proposing yeah. things and it's not working. I'm not knocking her for that. But. From what I understand, most of the times she appears in the show, it's in sketches that she's written. Um, and, like, if I'm being totally un- unfiltered with my opinions, which is the point of the show, <laughs> I think Sashir's a really, really brilliant writer, a really, really brilliant stand-up. She just released a stand-up special on CISO that I think is great. Sometimes I wonder if, like, sketch comedy is her niche, like, if that's where she thrives. Because mm. I don't always think that SNL was the place that best featured her as a talent. Right. And so I don't know if letting go of her is the wrong choice. Yeah, like, I question, like, to that point, is she a character actress right. or is she a stand-up? I think she's probably more of a stand-up and a really sharp, great writer. The thing, the issue with this story is the way she was let go. So basically, Bobby and Vanessa, the announcements that they were being let go were kind of preempted for this episode. And I think Saturday's episode, which was yesterday, did a really good job of kind of honoring them. Right. But I don't think the episode really paid tribute to everything that Sashir's done there. Mm -hmm. And they... People didn't even realize that she was being let go. Whereas it was, I mean, yeah. it's not in any. Ar- it is in the articles in the fine print. I feel like, yeah. but the big articles, and I understand that both Vanessa and Bobby have been there longer, and that they have had more limelight. But you do wonder, like, you wonder maybe if she was like fired or she's leaving. Like, you never know. You can't really tell. Yeah. But I don't just, know anything. I don't yeah. know anything. But here's what I think. The, the way they had, there was a sketch, I guess, a high school graduation mm-hmm. sketch where they had Bobby and Vanessa and Bobby's going off to do a TV show on CBS, which is a huge like gamble at this point to leave to do a sitcom on a network. I know. You know? But I mean, whatever it is, you know, maybe I thought that he left on his own accord, but I don't know. Maybe they got rid of him. It's all, the funny you thing with know. these cast yeah. releases is like, you never know. You and no, yeah. And the cast members can't ever say because you have to stay in Lauren's good graces so yeah. it's like whether or not they were fired it's always I'm so grateful for my time at SNL this was such a gift which is true yeah. but mm-hmm. it's always confusing because yeah. like Lauren Michaels is the king so right. it's like you can't upset the yeah. king <laughs> going back to Shashir Shashir <laughs> sorry no one can say her name no, Shashir Shashir, Shashir. Yeah. yeah I was saying it before I can't you know, I'm on this microphone I can't say it like an idiot uh, going back to her uh, I think that that was the last minute like oh we're done I wonder because the others seem to have a setup. You know, at least yeah. there was an acknowledgement of the departure. And then they, they said that they hoisted them on chairs and they carried them out. And then they, like, put her on a chair and carried her out. <laughs> it was like, oh, everyone's like, oh, I guess she's out. Right. But it seems to me like it was a last minute just acts. You have to wonder a little bit because I don't think it's often. I don't know SNL history as well as maybe you, Jeff. But I don't know if there's a lot of times more than one African-American woman on the show at the same time. And Leslie Jones is amazing, and right. she's kicking butt. And I, I mean, she's super talented. But it feels a little bit like they f- maybe have their black girl. Yeah, and I don't know mm-hmm. if that's what it is at all. But you can't help but wonder because I, like I said, I don't remember a time where there were multiple black women on that show. Yeah. There's very rarely ever black women on the show. I mean, yeah. Maya Rudolph. I was going to say Maya. She was different. Her mom was black. Yeah. Um, but that's the kind of uncomfortable thing with SNL is, I mean, maybe it's the audience imposing restrictions on them. And diversity is great. But there's just the race problem has been something that's plagued SNL for yeah. 42 years. Right. And well, they, they, what they need in their cast is different categories. So they need like a leading lady type, a gorgeous mm-hmm. woman. They need, they usually have a heavy set woman and then they've got all these different categories types, types yeah, that they right. try to fill. And it seems like there's been one African American type. Mm-hmm. And that means that person's going to play Beyonce. They're going to play Rihanna. They're going to play all yeah, the black. Yeah. And that's their job on there. But for some reason with all those other archetypes, they're just generally white people. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, I it's know. complicated. Yeah, I mean, to, to Lauren's defense, he did say that he's like, well, I'm not just going to go out and hire anyone based on their race. They have to come to the table with right. all the same skills as everybody else. Um, For sure. You know, so I, I get where he's coming. Like, that's a very, you know, PC line to say, you mm-hmm. know, like that, that kind of covers everything. But yeah, I mean, I wonder maybe if she wasn't the right choice to begin with and they just cast her because they needed to fill a role. And that totally... Totally could be it. I don't know. Do you know the history of basically in 2012, 2013, all of a sudden there was all this media attention on SNL for the realization that they hadn't had. I remember that. it was like overnight. It's like, oh, why yeah. is there no black actress on the show? Right, exactly. Why, why is there only Keenan on the show? Yeah. They didn't notice for And Sashir got hired. Sashir <laughs> got hired two weeks later. Um, and yeah. granted, I want to qualify this by saying I think she's extremely talented. I think she's an amazing writer. Um, and I think some of her pen sketches have been the sharpest on the show. But you wonder, like, maybe they would have hired a bigger character actress like Leslie Jones if they didn't feel as pressured to hire her. Mm-hmm. And now that Leslie's getting all this acclaim and actual acting talent credits, if they're like, okay, now we can kind of slide Sashir out. You know, we're taken care of. We're not going to get criticized. And Leslie can kind of fill that role. Right. And also, just to stand behind Lauren as well, like, the people who audition for the show need to be up to par. No matter what archetype, whatever, no matter what you are as a mm-hmm. person, what you look like, anything, they need to be up to par. And he does have a history of having a very successful show. Right. Yeah. And that was what he's doing. Um, and I will say it's better than last year because last year they announced that Taryn Killam and Jay Farrow were getting let go halfway through the summer. So, like, at least who knows when Sashir found out, who knows if she left on her own accord, but yeah. at least she had five hours of notice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, that yes. show, it's always under a microscope, and it is, I'm sure it's tough from a producing standpoint yeah, having to navigate yeah. all of the constant criticism they face. That show's always such a wave of good and bad. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know they're on it and they're re- way out of it, and mm-hmm. then they're gonna reinvent. And so who knows what's next? Yeah, I'm sad to see Vanessa Bayer go. I think yeah, she's good. She's especially good. she introduced a new character this season, like three episodes ago, that people are loving, and now we'll never get to see it again, which is like kind mm-hmm. of a bummer. But oh, she'll be back. She'll be back. Yeah. She'll, 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 she'll be back. She'll be back. Who's right. gonna play Beyonce? I know. <laughs> Speaking of her, I'm trying to make a transition, a very weak one. <laughs> yes. Um, but yes. Yeah, so Beyonce and Jay Z, Forbes just announced that they are now a billion dollar couple. And that's a lot to wrap your mind around. Um, yeah. You don't have a billion dollars, Grant, uh, for this I'm, podcast? Uh, <laughs> I love my house, but uh, no. <laughs> uh, yes. So the, they, are, like, I really was surprised, especially now they say, you know, the business has changed, you know, there's no money in this and that. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with investments. So we can break all that down as to what they've got. But according to an article on CNN Money, Forbes announced that they have a uh, net worth of one point. One six billion dollars. Jay Z is the top earner in that combo, with uh, being worth eight hundred and ten million dollars. A lot Except for someone who really started out in the projects. That's yeah, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Um, and Beyonce three hundred and fifty mil, and um, she said that she's never satisfied, so she's just going to keep working. She's the hardest worker she knows, and all that. So <laughs> keep going. I mean, it's working, right? Um, you're a huge Beyonce fan. I love Beyonce. I'm honestly a little surprised that the difference between the two of them and how much they're worth is so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a steep um, difference. But at the same time, if you remember, we have to think of all of Jay Z's production that he does. He has alcohol that he that's his yeah. alcohol. He owns title. Like he, I think he's been really savvy with all of that. Yeah, he invested in Uber. Or yeah, something. Uh, yeah, he's got that entertainment firm and then uh, an investment business, like an investment company, and then Title, which I don't know how much Title could be worth. To be I honest. know. Well, didn't it say somewhere that there was a two hundred million dollar AT and T? I think. Yes, yeah, someone yeah. bought in like, like two hundred million, and I was thinking, yeah. what was Beyonce like three hundred? That was like yeah. what Beyonce's <laughs> worth was just for. Wow. I can't title. believe Title's working. When I heard about no. Title, the pitch, I was like, this is nothing. Like this isn't going to work. And it's <laughs> apparently doing well. It's doing well enough, and because of Beyonce, like, I know. <laughs> I'm like, how to give credit to Beyonce? If you're gonna, if you're you're going to pick one pop star and make it that they're exclusive and the thing will succeed, it's Beyonce. I mean, like, yeah. she's the queen, so. I was talking about Title last night, and they were saying that the difference, the pitch was, I guess, that they're supposed to have high-quality 
audio files yeah. versus compressed ones. Right. And I was like, okay, like that's that's like and it's like in the fine print, like a bullet point of why it should be better. Okay. But I don't think it's a main selling point because let's be real, like we're all listening to um, our music on those white right. free right. iPhone headphones. So I in couldn't theory, agree more. In theory, it's a great idea, but who's really yeah. going to notice? Except for it, those yeah. that select group of people who this is what they yeah. do. It is not a selling point for me. Like I have no interest. I have Apple Music, so I'm good. You know what right. I mean? Like I'm not looking for that. Yeah. But yeah, so Beyonce, she's credited with um, owning the stake and title, Ivy Park clothing line, and then um, she has a management company, Parkwood mm-hmm. Entertainment. So, she, I mean, no, no joke, but yeah, it's like a $500 million it's difference. A big difference. And yeah. like I said, I'm surprised. I love Beyonce. The yeah. thing that yeah. surprised me most about the coverage on this was we learned that Diddy's still worth more. Right. <laughs> I was like, Diddy? I know. I haven't heard that again. I know. I know. <laughs> what is he doing? Like, I, mean, I mean, I know he's doing plenty. <laughs> but like, he's doing a lot. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where he is. I've I would have him. thought Dr. Dre would have been the kingpin of hip hop. Yeah. Especially with beats, but he's, I guess. I know. I read an article about him being extremely high up there, but I guess I he can't Uber. scratch these two. I, yeah, I mean, I, Uber. I, I, I say <laughs> all credit to them. I like Jay Z and Beyonce. I mean, like, I think they're pretty classy. Um,. I don't. I feel like I haven't followed as much of the kind of gossip and with the two of them. And I mean, lemonade uh, kind of makes everything complicated. Yeah. But we can get into all that. But yeah. regardless of whether it <laughs> happened or whether it didn't happen, it was an incredible album yes. and it was incredible art about what it would be like if this happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I mean, yeah. I I say all credit to them. They worked I, hard. Yeah. I mean, I I'm not a major Beyonce fan. I really don't really care for Jay Z. But oh, I <laughs> but I love Power Cup. And yeah. I'm happy for them. So I just thought that was an interesting accomplishment. I mean, it's, they're huge names. You wonder the net worth of these people. And I had an episode way back in October where we kind of broke down like what TV stars make, what's considered high for TV stars and what's considered very high for film actors. So it's always interesting to see how people make. I like looking at incomes and right. real estate. Mm-hmm. I love looking at celebrity real estate, which is hard to do on this show because it's, it's in – auditory media mm, you know right, what yeah. I mean we can talk about and I've wanted to do this I've looked at these articles and it's like you know Adele's five bedroom house in Beverly Hills and it has a pool and you know heated floors but is that great to listen to you know what I mean I don't know <laughs> it's, I like to look at the pictures exactly. and see like wow this kitchen is unreal right but to describe for me to just got there's a sunlight a sun a moon roof like or like a sunlight <laughs> I don't know like what am I talking about like a sun roof <laughs> over the sink like no one's gonna care right but I love all that stuff Let's talk about uh, another wealthy person who's no longer here. <laughs> Alan Thicke is going through quite an interesting um, battle for his estate. And, you know, you really can find out the worth of someone, not necessarily the worth of him, but the worth of his sons after they pass. You can see what mm-hmm. they're grabbing for. Um, so this is a story that was broken all over the place on E! and Good Morning America. So he died in December, and now the sons are filing a petition in court against his widow, and they want the estate that she lived at, the actual house. And, you know, she's saying that the prenup wasn't, you know, accurate, and now she's kind of petitioning that. Good luck. Good luck to right. her. What do you think of the two sons now turning against their stepmother, really? I mean, I think it shows that they've clearly never had a good relationship because I have a stepmother and I love my stepmother. And if something happened to my dad, I would not be going after her for all of that um, because I would allow her to continue to live, live her life. I would know that she was grieving and I would trust that when she passed, then the estate would be going to me anyway. So <laughs> yeah, I it clearly shows that they've not had a great relationship, but at the same if that is true and they don't have a good relationship i understand why they're going after it if they don't trust her with this clearly then Mm -hmm. all power to isn't robin thick the ultimate douchebag yes i think he is (laughs) yeah i've never liked him i think he's a great vocalist but i yeah (laughs) she's got some great songs you know what i think robin thick got lucky yeah he had the right money behind him and yeah i mean i just like when blurred lines came out Pretty immediately, I was like, this song is kind of creepy. And then they had that music video. And I like Pharrell, but like... The music video was what creeped me out. Yeah, there's... Yeah. And they're like, oh, it's funny. It's not sexual. And I'm like, if you're going to have two incredibly wealthy dudes surrounded by two topless 20-somethings... And now Emily... Is it Ratajowski? I can never say her last name correctly, but... Know. 
Now she's kind of doing her thing and she's making a career, but you can't say we hired two video girls, made them prance around topless around us with balloons that say Robin Thicke has a huge dick. And like, this is feminist. Like, <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, all those rap girls, all those rap video girls are all feminists. All right, yeah. I just like that whole thing kind yeah. of gave me the spooks. All right. and, like, it's so funny because you actually like analyzed it and looked at it. But and, I was like, whoa, this song's great. Like, yeah. I was like, dancing in the club. It was like, catchy. Now that you say that. I know. <laughs> I mean, and I just... And then when he twerked on Miley Cyrus, like, yeah, I hate that I'm talking about it, but, like, he's always kind of just, I've never loved him. But I will say, looking at the story, it does seem like that, is it Tanya? Is that Tanya, her? yeah, the, the current wife, the widow of yeah. Alan, yeah. It does seem like she's in the wrong here. Like, from what I understand, legally, all of the claims she's making don't hold up on paper. Is that what yeah, you've gathered I, I as would, well? Yeah, I would gather as well. Yeah, I mean, so basically, she's received... She gets the ranch, which is then divided. The worth of that is divided in three different ways for the three sons, but she can live there. So that's already a positive. She gets 25% of his personal items and then $500,000 in a life insurance policy. Woo! So, I mean, I'd take it. I don't know <laughs> it sounds she, good to me. She, but, yeah. yet, but yet she claims that he, like, made a mistake. So now she has to prove this, that he his intentions were different. However, he updated that. At the beginning of 2016, in February of 2016, died in December 2016. So how much can change in 10 right. months? Wow. He sent that. a Snapchat in April that said, you should have this necklace, and now she feels entitled to everything. You, know, <laughs> you have to wonder, like, what would proof be? Like, you could even, like, have text where it's like, I love you, what's mine is yours, and all these things, but, like, what is that, that actual proof yeah. of this entire huge estate? Like, so I... the court just, has to decide. See it, I can't see it happening. Right. I can't see it happening. Yeah, I mean, they're painting her as the gold digger. She's his third wife. She's younger. Mm. Um, I didn't watch that show Unusually Thick. I didn't watch that reality show on pop TV. That's okay. So, <laughs> I can't speak to... I watch them interact, but who cares? <laughs> so, now, TMZ says that the, the brothers want to turn this into a pot farm or whatever. They've got a bunch of acreage oh. outside of Santa Barbara and Carpentino, which is not Carp- that's like Carpentaria, which mm. is extremely high income. And it's like Oprah's next door in Montecito. Like that's where we're that's what we're looking at. Like huge yeah. estates. So I don't know. I don't know if that's what they're looking to do. That's what TMZ says, uh, which I would be against. And I kind of understand why she wouldn't want to live. You know, with a pot farm. With a pot said? farm. A pot yeah. farm. I heard you yeah. right. Okay, great. Yeah. Maybe Beyonce <laughs> should get a pot farm, get a lot more money, and catch up to Jay Z. Oh. oh, there it is. Hey, that's Strategy. what needs to happen here. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, it would be easier for me to, like, take a side if I liked Robin Thicke. <laughs> like, sure. I know, I know. It's kind of sad. I hate when people pass and then the, all the money grabbers come out and want to know the worth of things. Look at Wills. It's yeah. ugly. We, had a, so we covered ugly. a story. Like, this was the Prince Arsenio Hall, Sinead O'Connor thing. It's like whenever someone dies, all these people come out of the woodwork. And, you yes. know, it's like it really will kind of negatively shadow okay. someone's death. Did we talk about that on Grant's Rants? Yeah, we talked about we it talked on Sinead. Sinead O'Connor wanted to, oh, something with uh, Prince, yeah. Yeah, right, so yeah. Sinead O'Connor was good claiming, memory. yeah, yeah, I re-listened to the episode before I came oh, out. Make sure I had the <laughs> format. Right. Oh, God, yeah. Um, That's but, the one. Yeah, the claim was that, this was so weird, it was fascinated me, but the claim was that Sinead O'Connor accused Arsenio Hall of dealing drugs to Prince. Oh, Oh, yes. my God. When Prince died. And, like, no one had heard of Sinead or Arsenio for, like, ten years. It was the <laughs> weirdest story. Yes. But this is what happens. I mean, like, whenever money's involved, integrity just goes out the window. Yeah, that's the truth. Well, yeah. they have a hearing set for July 25th, so we'll keep you updated if it's interesting, you know? Yeah. If it's just, like, you know, boring, then we're going to be talking about Bill Cosby. I want oh, I I mean, to. I've been trying to latch on to a, a celebrity court hearing, like a trial, forever. So, well, Abby Lee Grant is that um, is that kosher to bring up on uh, this? Yeah, we can talk about Abby Lee real quick. Yeah, Abby Lee, the roach will be in jail for a year or so. so. <laughs> Do you know Dance Moms at all, Sheldon? Oh, Abby Lee, that's who we're talking about. <laughs> See ya. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, all her press just side note. She is just like milking it. No, no um, guilt. 
or um, what's the I word know. I'm thinking of? Like remorse. Movie? Remorse. No, yeah. movie remorse. No. <laughs> She's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna pretend I'm on a movie set. That's it's what like she said. Shooting a movie. I'm gonna write a book, and yeah, I'm gonna try to you know swim in the pool if there is one. It's gonna be great. Yeah, she's fabulous. <laughs> well, I she guess. just showed up Apparently. at the premiere for What Happens at the Abbey, so I'm like, oh, clear, she did. Yeah, yeah I like, watched that one interview. Yeah, After Buzz got a nice exclusive. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, well, clearly she's just gonna till the last minute go to all these carpets and yes. <sighs> Abby Lee, I don't know. I, I she is expecting to come back and take over once again, but she's gonna be gone for a full year, and people yeah. are already tired of her ass. So Martha did it. She's back. Yeah, we'll see. She's gonna have to be real smart, and I don't think she's real smart. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. All right. Well, when we return, we're going to be talking more to these guys. I'm gonna be learning more about improv 101 in a moment. You're listening to Grant's Rants. Please rate, subscribe, and share. Spread the word. There are a lot more rants to come. Listen anytime on all major podcasting platforms and YouTube for bonus content. And now, back to the show. And we're back, ranting with Jeff and Sheldon. And we're going to learn about their new exciting project that you can find online starting when? You know, starting Tuesday, May 23rd. 23rd. Yeah, so yes. we're dropping Improv in. 101, the name. We're going to yes, say it. the name. Yeah, yes. Improv 101. <laughs> it's a sketch series dropping on Tuesday, May 23rd, and you can find it on the YouTube channel Mind Probe Productions. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, Jeff, let's catch up. You mentioned episode 27. We talked about Sinead O'Connor. Yes. So, since then, since Nasty Ladies, since Taking Honky Back, yes. what's up? <laughs> you know, I've been um, doing some more music, which has been really fun. Oh, good. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. so I'm uh, going to be releasing some stuff soon, which is fun. And um, the big thing, I think, since then is I told you I write a little bit, too. Yes. And, yeah, I wrote a comedy pilot that got some buzz in the blacklist again, which is really exciting. So Good for you, yeah. Yeah, I'm still kind of trying to figure out how to leverage that into, like, money and representation. But I'm getting closer, I feel like, every yeah, month. Yeah, just keep placing. And, exactly. You know, just yeah. doing the work. Yeah. Um, so if anyone's interested, um, yeah, because I'll, I'll promote something else with this as well. But, yeah, the pilot's called We've Got Kids. And it's a pretty conventional network sitcom, which I hadn't written before. A lot of my stuff, I feel like, tonally, as I mentioned last time kind of um, has that sort of Judd Apatow sort of comedy drama balance and this is very much a straightforward family friendly network comedy kind of inspired by like a modern family so okay. is it 30 minute 30 minute 30 minute single cam um, those are not easy to write yeah I love structure so yeah. I had a lot of fun writing it but it was really my first time doing something completely network so mm-hmm. it's act broken and everything and nice. Yeah, um, if anyone's interested in checking it out, actually, I also, since we last spoke, I've been producing a show over at After Buzz for their sister network, Popcorn Talk, um, called The Unproduced Table Read, which is a um, podcast where we table read unproduced pilots and features. Uh, where um, do you pull those from? A lot of them do come from the Blacklist okay. website. We've had a couple nickel winners, so for those who love writing, um, the Academy of Arts and Sciences, which of course like does the Oscars, is probably how yeah. your listeners would know, um, does a competition called the Nickel Competition, where they um, select features. They'll like select five or six features that they feel represent the best mm-hmm. unproduced features of the year. So we've had a couple nickel finalists, which has been fun. Yeah. And yeah. On this podcast, do you, do you just table read the, exactly. the script? So oh, wow. we'll, well I would, bring... I would be very interested in that. It's yeah. fun. It's yeah. You should definitely check it out. Yeah. I've been a part of it once, and it's a blast. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. It's um, We've done 15 episodes. So, That's great. Yeah, yeah, we'll bring the writer in, and we'll do a quick intro with them, then table read the script, and then do like a 30-minute Q&A with them after the show to talk about their process, talk about the script. Talk what about is the name of the show? The show is called The Unproduced Table Read, and you can find it on iTunes or on the internet. So, yeah, I'm really proud of it. If For your listeners who might like comedy who are listening to this episode, um, if you're looking for a feature, I'd recommend a script. It's called The United States of Effing Awesome, and that okay. effing is not censored. So, okay. um, And another comedy, there's one we're reading this Friday called Moguls that I would also recommend for comedy mm-hmm. fans. Um, so for anyone, we have a huge variety of scripts for anyone who's interested. So we've got teen yeah. dramas, we've got comedies, we've got conventional dramas, and yeah, I'm really proud of the show, so that's the unproduced table read. Well, I want more music. Yeah. I have, I have you know, when I travel, I, I have very little music on my phone but i have nasty ladies on my phone yes oh it always makes an appearance when i'm in the sky somewhere I love it's it. always 
about this. So, yeah, it just makes me laugh. I know, like, every word to that song. Yeah. It just makes me laugh. Well, it so, means so much. You're one of the five maybe. people that loves the album, Grant. So I'm very happy. <laughs> yeah, so here we are. Yeah. Yeah, so that's great. So let's turn to Sheldon. and let's. I want to know more about you. I know you're an actor. And, yes. you know, we always do a, a great profile on this show of motivations and long-term goals and what brought you to L.A. So, you know, to fill me in. So let's see. I'm from small town Ohio, small town Ohio, and I started acting when I was about 14. I did my first musical at a community theater, and I was in Honk Jr., and it's a cute little story of the ugly duckling, and I played the ugly bullfrog. It was brilliant (laughs) acting all the way around. So then I started doing a lot of regional theater. I've done over 20 musicals. Um, some of my favorites were Rocky Horror, the musical, was so fun. And as, if you've ever seen Evil Dead, the musical, it's literally the funniest musical oh, I've <laughs> ever been a part of. It's, uh, it's just a, like a low budget spoof on how ridiculous those horror movies were. It's mm-hmm. one of my favorite things ever. And then I went to school and um, that's where I met Jeff and we sang together in an acapella group. Um, which was super fun. That actually led us to our next job, which was singing on a cruise line for six months all around the world. Um, and then we got to make our way to LA, which was awesome. And uh, since I've been here, I mean, I really, I had a friend, her name, I have a friend, her name is Lindsay Hollister. She's a friend and a mentor, and she's been out here for a while acting. And I always wanted to come here, but coming from small town Ohio, I didn't really think of it as a real life possibility and I met her when I was at school and she highly encouraged me to come and essentially like gave me the momentum that I needed to get myself out here um and I'm so thankful for her for that and yeah now I've been out here I've been pursuing acting since I got here I've done a lot of different commercials from like Burger King, to a Charter Spectrum. I just did Nature's Bounty. I'm actually in a Samsung ad right now. There's a new, really cool 3D camera, um, and oh, it's yeah. a print ad for that. And yeah, I've been also doing, you know, some TV things. I'm filming something this next week that I can't really talk about right now. Um, but I just did Dan Harmon's new show, his new YouTube Red show, which should be fun. That's great. When it comes to commercials, how do you get paid for those? Is it paid per airing of those, or do you get a flat rate? It depends. Um, a lot of times, the ones that I've been getting are the flat rate ones. So essentially, you get a flat rate, you get a day rate, and then you get a their, their per, a rate so that they can use it however they would like in a certain amount of time. For those listening, the rate ain't bad, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why I ask. Because yeah. sometimes, I mean, these people can, like, take a year off and they do two commercials. Yeah, and that's, and that's it. And the crazy thing is if they have a really high-budget commercial, which I've never got, but I will one day, but those high-budget commercials, if they decide to play it for another year after the contract's over, you get another huge check. So you're sitting oh, wow. in your apartment and all of a sudden a big check comes and you know Ooh. that your commercial's back. Yeah. Apparently. One day. We'll <laughs> oh, be there. You need to get in like a Britney Spears Pepsi commercial. That's what yeah. Wouldn't that be the best? I could do that. I could do that. You'd um, crush it. That'd be fun. Yes. But yeah, so I, you know, I always, I've always been fascinated by people. I love uh, understanding people, who they are, why they're who they are. I love villains because I think... I love villains, at least when they have a good reason for why they're evil, because I don't right. think people are generally evil. But I just love people. So I've always loved getting inside people's heads, understanding people, and then bringing life to that. Tell us about Mind Probe Productions. Mind Probe Productions. So Jeff and I started a company called mm-hmm. Mind Probe Productions. And essentially, since I've since we've both been here... We've been working with a lot of people from our school that we went to, um, Miami University. Of Ohio. We're proud. We were a university before Florida was even a state, and we're the nation's seventh public oldest institution in the country, so... When you say that, it reminds me of Kelly on The Office. Do you know the scene that I'm talking about? I know exactly the scene you're talking yes, about, and I love Kelly Kapoor, yes, so... Yes, so she's going to Miami, she's giving out her coats, and then she doesn't know that it's Miami, just Ohio, right? Yes. I need to see this scene. It's great. Yes. Minnie Kaling is a hero of mine, yes. so... Um, but yeah, we met in school, and as Sheldon was mentioning, we've been lucky to really kind of create a network of really talented people from Miami University who moved out here, and we were really lucky too because Lindsay Hollister, the one I mentioned a while ago, she taught me in the first like two or three months with some Miami alum to create your own project. So we did a short film called Bad Service right when I moved here, which for me was the best education I could have gotten in terms of 
acting on camera because yeah. I come from a theater background. Um, and so she inspired me to create my own project. And then Jeff was here as well. And so Jeff and I have been working together since that project. Um, and we developed a pilot a while ago called Spin mm-hmm. that we have on our Mind Pro production channel. And we learned a lot from that. It was super fun and we are proud of it. And we decided to do something more on our own. The name, we, we should shout out the name. A Mind Probe is like kind of the on-campus like drink that we've, it was like something that everyone at Miami University knows. Okay. Like a Mind Probe is like the best way to start off your night, like at all the bars. <laughs> so it's like, that's where the name comes and from. And if you're not a drinker, you're not a party, it's something, it's a Mind Probe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you don't know the reference, we yeah, like to probe yeah, yeah. your mind with our creative with, content. Yes. But so it's a cocktail? It's a cocktail. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, so basically after Spin, Sheldon and I... Well, I guess we might as well talk about the inspirations for the series first. There were a lot of things that we liked from Spin and a lot of things that we wanted to try again. I mean, every time you do a project, you want to do another one and you want to find a way to do it better. Mm -hmm. So we decided to take the helm on the next project. We didn't really know what it would be, and we ended up taking class together. Yeah, so we took um, 101 at a local improv school, and um, we loved it. And we found that there was very specific moments that were very, very funny to us. I mean, any classroom, I think, is a rich environment for comedy. Mm -hmm. But when you're in a classroom with a ton of different kinds of people, um, especially types of people that seem to show up universally in improv classes, you know, like the housewife or like the young aspiring actor, maybe the actor who had their heyday in the 90s who's trying to get back into the scene. When you combine that with a uh, kind of a breeding ground of potentially uncomfortable situations that come up in an improv class. We just found it was a very universal, hilarious, kind of fertile ground for us to explore comedy. That's exactly right. I mean, the funniest thing is when we talk about a lot of the themes that happen in each of our six episodes, people who took improv class, a different class, a different place, all could relate one way or yeah. another to the weird things that keep coming up. Right. Yeah. In this, this series, you really do take the rules that <laughs> come with being in these imp- early improv classes and finding the humor behind them for sure. Yeah. It's very yeah. apparent. Yes. Yeah. So we kind of were like, you know, we need to find a director for this. Uh, but I directed a couple of music videos that you were aware of. And we're like, I don't know, should we write? this whole thing but we started writing and we ended up after a couple months had six episodes that we were happy with so we're like you know we can shoot this for really really cheap luckily we had a connection to a pretty good location and we wrote and directed and shot and edited the whole thing so this was i think it's been really valuable for us to see a project literally from conception to the last edit and post yeah yeah we've learned a ton from it and we're really proud of it we're super proud yeah and we we luckily because we've been here for a minute, we have all these connections. I mean, they're, the nice thing about our cast is we have people who have studied at UCB, who studied at Groundlings, Nerdist, to Second City. And we got these are all big uh, improv troops uh, locations. Is that the word? Studios? Schools. Yeah, schools. schools. Yeah. 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 There's no exact word for it, but right. yeah. And we just surrounded ourselves with all these really talented people that are in their own way. Some of them are up and coming. They're doing their own little projects. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. getting cast here and there and little things and bigger things and we just have I just know all these people who are right there next to me hustling trying to get the next thing going all the time and we just got a really talented group together to make this happen it is great to see something that you've done yourself come together Mm -hmm. and then put it out for the masses I mean like there's nothing like that for me like I did a God, all through high school, I did a show for like two seasons of this show, and we had like an opening night because this was like before the internet was anything. Like it was two thousand and seven. Yeah, YouTube was oh five, so like you could only upload like fifteen minutes. Remember, you could only upload like up to fifteen minutes yeah. on YouTube. So these were like you know like forty minute episodes. Like this was like a big wow. deal. So like I like didn't have any way to distribute them. So we had like an opening night, and that was like such a good moment to be able mm-hmm. to like have the show projected and get the feedback. But I wish the internet was around them because now you guys have this instant gratification it can be shared anywhere around the world and you can find it by you know with all these avenues in which you promote it it's nice and i i do think what was 
you know, it was tough for us to f- see it through from the seedling of an idea to the end. And it meant a lot of work. We spent a lot of time in editing. Um, <laughs> so much time editing. Editing is its own beast. And like, we learned. Yeah, I mean, great editors are just faster. Like, I think we're, pr- we're proud of the edit. But, like, I know an editor probably could have cut it faster than we would have. But that's okay because I think more or less we really produced and wrote and cut together the series we wanted to, um, which is exciting for us. I mean, yeah, we did it. it, it we did it. In the filming process, too, which is crazy for us to think about, but we did 26 pages of material in two days. We did it in, like, 26 hours, really, yeah. back to back, which is kind of... A, ambitious. A very a ambitious. Lot. Yeah, I don't think people realize the, the pace that it takes to record these, or to tape record these scenes and to light these scenes yeah. and to go over them and block them and then have to go back and get coverage and get other people. Right. So it's it's there's a lot to it. Um, you know, 26 pages is times... Each page by, like, at least, like, what, like an hour and a half, if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's we like shot get, it. To in get a, done. You exactly. Know, from, like, start to finish. Right. Yeah, we shot it in a very, we really tried to design a production schedule. We planned that, and planned and planned to be as concise as possible. Yeah, but, it, I mean, it was, <laughs> I think we were, like, going into it, kind of really producing and directing our first shoot. We were like, this is a very ambitious production schedule. But we had, a, I mean, our cast was awesome. Amazing. They came to set really prepared, and we just moved on set, which was great. It's a one-location yeah. shoot, as you'll see in the um, in the release. But, um, yeah. We, yeah, we did it. So we're like really excited. We're about excited. It. And yeah. It's a weird, like you said, it's fun to release your stuff, but it's also a very vulnerable, a little nervous yeah, feeling yeah. Um, to see how everyone responds. To yeah, it. especially now, like as adults, you know, like with me in the past, like it was like I was younger. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> you fall now back it's on like that. I'm like this is like post film school for me. You know what I mean? Like so, it's like we're adults. It's not just like experimental. Like, yeah. It's it's our name is on it, and it's right. out there, and it's gonna live online forever. Yeah, forever. <laughs> it will. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, talk a little bit more about the, um, the your hopes for the series and, like, where you want it to go and, and how you want it to be received, obviously, well. But, yeah. You know, what's the goal? Like, where are, you, are you sending it anywhere? What are you looking at? One, well, one of our hopes, definitely. The nice thing, one thing that we really tried to do is each episode, people can relate to different things. We tried to, because we said it's such a universal theme, one of our hopes is that someone will see an episode and they'll look at it and think, oh my gosh, I was in that situation, whether it was in my business class or my whatever class, I know the situation that they're in right now. Yeah. So one of our hopes, obviously, is just for people to receive it well. And then we would like, I mean, we're already developing season two. Mm -hmm. We're working on that. We're coming up with ideas for things like that. And then, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the point you get at is, like, this series is for improvisers, but it's also for anyone. Um, So if any of you guys listening have ever taken an improv class... There's a lot of Easter eggs in there, I think, that you'd really connect with. But, like, I showed my grandma the series, and, like, she's a Republican from Cincinnati, and, like, she loved it. So I think yeah. our hope is that we really did kind of write a series for everyone, I hope. Um, but improvisers, yeah. I think, especially will respond to it. I will say, like, each character, from what I viewed it, really has their own voice and their their own track. Mm-hmm. Um, no one is kind of, like, the blah character. You know, everyone you can tell, like, has, like... They're, 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 you've written dynamic characters, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. That was a goal, so I'm glad. Yeah. We, part of that owes to our great cast. Um, yeah. No one, no one um, faded into the background. Now, tell me about the teacher. <laughs> She's, She's pretty great. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. She's- Watch for, watch for her. Like, if you're curious, you're like, maybe I'm going to look at this. Watch it. Yeah. So you can see this teacher in action. Nikki Gazelle. I met her in one of my acting classes. And the moment I met her and saw her perform, I was like, there is just something so special about her. And she's her kindness, her kindness, her her warmth. warmth, and then also this incredibly quirky side. And she's just such a wonderful blend of a human. Um, and as we were writing it, all of a sudden it popped in my head. I was like, oh my gosh, it has to be Nikki. Mm -hmm. And because she just, she brings something to the role that no one else could possibly bring. She's an incredibly talented comedian. I mean, like she's been on 30 Rock. She's really worked closely with a lot of huge comedy bigwigs. Um, So we were, I feel like pretty lucky to get her, especially we asked a lot of her. Um, She's kind of, in terms of performances, she's the glue that really hinges the whole series together. Yeah. And we asked her to really give us like 15 pages in two days. Um, Mm. And she just nailed it. 
Yeah. And she's also, I mean, not only was she nailing it on set with us, she was like, oh, are we done? Like, in a plot, when we were done, she's like, oh, we're done? Okay, great. I'm going to go do my, my improv show tonight. Mm-hmm. And she just, like, runs off and gets yeah. on stage and performs in front of a ton of people at Nerdist. Like, she's a big, I feel like she's a big name in the comedy community. Um, and so, for those who haven't seen the series, she plays the teacher. Yeah. Um, and she's kind of your classic, quirky. She reminds me of my theater teacher. When she had, my theater teacher had red hair. Yeah. And was very overbearing. But it was, like, brilliant. Yeah. You know? But, I mean, like, she was brilliant, but it was... Um, she asked a lot of, of students who perhaps were not ready for such things. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. She's, like, all about pushing the class to get out of their comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and as a newer director, I felt so grateful to be working with such a generous, talented actress who I knew I could potentially challenge on set or ask tricky questions and was just so on our team. So we're so yeah. grateful. Yeah, she's ex- – Nikki Gazelle – is extremely mm-hmm. talented. We love yes. you, Nikki. Yeah. <laughs> so check out this se- this series. Yes. So you can see Nikki Lizelle and it's really and the others, of course. But like you said, she's the glue of this, and yeah. it's so great that you have her cast in that role because it really just takes the show off. Mm-hmm. So please, I encourage you to check out the show. You guys can support these guys. To, where can we find the show? Of course, we mentioned it's YouTube, correct? Yeah, so um, we're putting up all six episodes on Tuesday, May 23rd. Well, we can binge watch. You can binge it. Improv yeah, that's 101. Exactly. That's the new model. So we're definitely, um, we're going to feature kind of on our social media. If you follow me on Twitter, you can do that. But we're going to feature a new episode every week. But the, we're going to put them all up. And we encourage you to binge them. We feel like it's a very bingeable series. It is. I, I watched them all back to back. Thank yeah. you, Grant. I appreciate it. It's not oh. a huge commitment. It's 20, <laughs> 23 minutes of your time to watch all six. Um, but yeah, we're going to put them up on YouTube. YouTube.com on our, I don't know if we have a specific URL and I should, but if you search Improv 101 Mind Probe, you'll or, find it. Or you can just look at the information beneath this episode yes. and you can link yourself right there very quickly. Absolutely. Copy and paste. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, perfect. Go. But we're going to post all six just in a playlist. So it's a very easy binge. And um, comedy fans, not comedy fans, anyone would really recommend the series. Definitely check it out. Yeah. Sounds you'll good. laugh. Yeah. All right. Well, where can we follow you guys and keep up with you on social media? Yes. So again, my name is Jeff Grant. Uh, thank you so much for having us. First of all, I really, really appreciate it. I didn't know if you were nervous. There's two empty uh, <laughs> bottles of Fireball here in the studio. My I'm like, <laughs> I, if I have one drink, I feel like I'm the best version of myself on camera. Really? Yeah. That's oh. always if I'm about to go on camera, I do something. I'll it's always not have good for Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Let's just have one drink. But well. I appreciate you preparing for the rant. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, if you guys want to find me online, you can do so at Jeffrey C. Graham on Twitter. I will post a link to this series in my bio on Twitter. So that's Jeffrey C. Graham. I also am proud to promote the series I mentioned earlier, The Unproduced Table Read. That's Fridays at 10 a.m. on the Popcorn Talk, or you can check out the podcast. And my name is Sheldon White. You can find me on all social media at Sheldon White and then the number two. And you can also find me on Netflix. The Outfield movie is coming out and I have a part in that. It's going to come out this summer along with Good Game, which is Dan Harmon's new show. I've got a fun little part in that as well. And yeah. Thank on you Amazon. Right? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah it's been right. some big yeah. stuff this year. It's been a big These year. guys are working. Good for, <laughs> good for this show. All right. Well, we, I love you for listening. There'll be plenty more rants to come, including... Our 61st show, which is coming up at the beginning of June, where we will be discussing the shows that have been announced at Upfronts. And it's going to be a panel show. My grandmother is in from Rhode Island. So it's going to be truly iconic. I can't wait to listen. <laughs> yes, there'll be more rants to come. This has been Grants Rants. Follow us on Twitter at Grants underscore underscore Rants. Cover art created by Howie Rone. Voiceover by Blake V Media. Original theme music composed by Alexander Arntzen. 